So today's lesson is on Archimedes' principle. Before we get to the principle, let's talk a little bit about the man. Archimedes lived in the third century BC. Here's a painting of him and here's a statue that kind of gives you an idea of what he looked like. A genius of a man. He came from Syracuse, which was actually then a part of the Greek Empire. And there it is. It's actually in Sicily, but uh, you can see it wasn't far from Athens. And uh, he was known as the Einstein of his time, maybe even greater than that. Um, the, probably the greatest thinker of um, ancient times. And uh, he was an inventor, a philosopher, a mathematician, an extraordinary person. Um, developed all kinds of inventions. Ironically, what he's perhaps best known for is a certain bath he took one day. Hmm. Let me explain. King Hero of Syracuse had taken a block of gold and given it to the goldsmith to make a crown out of. Okay? It wasn't the kind of crown he was going to wear. It was for a statue in a temple he was building. He got the crown and he thought it looked rather nice, but he was suspicious that perhaps the goldsmith had cheated him. Now the crown he got back weighed the exact same as the block of gold he had been given, but he was the king was thinking perhaps the goldsmith had taken out some of the gold, kept it for himself, stuck in some less expensive, less valuable metal like silver or something. He didn't know how to figure out whether this had happened or not. Okay, So the question was, was the crown the exact same as the gold he had been given? And he gave that to Archimedes as a problem, and Archimedes apparently struggled with that. Hmm, How could he figure out, without destroying the crown or whatever, whether it was made of the pure gold that he had been given? Um, so apparently the solution came to him as he was stepping into the bathtub, as is shown here. You see the crown on the ground there, and some spheres and different experiments he has going on. Um, and uh, supposedly he got so excited with it, with it when he discovered the solution to his problem, he screamed out, Eureka! And um, he ran through the streets of Syracuse, buck naked. Um, well, actually, I can see he's got the crown right there in his hand, so maybe he's not completely naked, but he's obviously drawing the stares of the local Syracusean town folks. Um, and different uh, depictions of this on the Internet have him, uh, you know, looking a little different there with his uh, little towel around the midsection, but still rather impressive. Apparently he coined the phrase Eureka, and Eureka happens to be the slogan for the state of California where Eureka gold was discovered back in the 1840s. But anyway, back to Archimedes' principle. Okay, before we start with it, a little bit of uh, information. This may not be very popular, but uh, as a little um, outcome of Archimedes' principle, um, it turns out that whatever you think you weigh, check out the scale there, you actually weigh more than you think you do. Hmm, why is that? Well, let's start with this as an example. Here is a container of liquid, we'll say it's water, and uh, a five kilogram weight, and a scale, okay? And we're going to hang that five kilogram weight on the scale, and there it shows five kilograms, great. So what happens when we then suspend this, when we're about to drop it into that water, what do you suppose is going to happen to that reading on the scale? Okay, well let's find out. Ah, as the object was submerged in the fluid, it appeared to lose weight. Look at that, it's down to around maybe 3.5 kilograms, whereas before it weighed 5 kilograms. It still weighs 5 kilograms, but there's some force pushing upward on it, a buoyant force. And that's what Archimedes' principle is all about. First, let's explain why that uh, effect is there, why there's a buoyant force at all. Keep in mind that the liquid is made up of molecules and that they're in constant motion, and because of that, they're pushing outward, upward, in all directions. We call that pressure. For water, it's called hydrostatic pressure. And uh, at the surface, that pressure exerts you know, a certain amount there, as shown by those four arrows, up, down, left, right. As you go deeper in that liquid, the pressure gets greater. Deeper still, greater still. Okay, and you're familiar with this. If you've ever gone swimming, you dive down to the bottom, you can feel it in your ears, the pressure there. And certainly divers who dive down 100 meters, scuba divers, I mean, they're under about 10 times the pressure they'd be out at the surface. Um, I can illustrate that also in this little diagram. Imagine I took a sharp pin and stuck it in the side of this, pulled it out, and saw how the water trickled out near the top, then stuck it in at the middle, and... Uh, comes out with more force. 
And now at the bottom, of course, it comes out even faster, more forcefully. So pressure increases as you move downward in a given fluid. Okay? Now, what does that have to do with the buoyant force? Well, check this out. Let's say the pressure was the same throughout. Okay? So I have arrows pushing upward, downward, left, right, all the same. Well, there would be no buoyant force, and you can see the 5 kilogram weight would still weigh 5 kilograms when suspended in the liquid. But we said that's not the case, remember? As you go down, pressure increases. So those arrows are getting progressively bigger, and certainly the ones across the bottom are bigger still. Well, let's look at that diagram. Look at all those forces. Certainly the ones on the left and the right would cancel each other out. They're equal and opposite on all accounts. But look at the ones on top and bottom. They would not cancel out. There's certainly a greater force pushing upward than there is pushing downward. So they would all add up to one force pushing upward. That is the buoyant force. And watch here. That's what giving that, that lift and making it appear to weigh less than it did before. Okay? So buoyant force caused by the water being displaced. There's more to it than that. And to really emphasize that, I've got to point out that this applies to any kind of fluid. Now, fluid is a term that refers to not just liquids, but also gases as well. Okay? And one gas we're certainly familiar with is the air that we're surrounded by. It's been said that we survive at the bottom of an ocean of air. That's true. And that ocean's rather deep, as you can see in this diagram. Our entire experience really takes place way at the bottom in that little yellow band there, the troposphere. Um, I think airplanes probably fly around the top of that yellow layer. But, so that's the, the main area. But that's all filled with fluid. And uh, granted, that fluid is air, which is much less dense, about 1 1,000th the density of water. Still, though, it's a fluid. Objects in it are displacing that fluid. And they're being buoyed up by that force. So, just to point that out, if in a mountain you think about the pressure at the bottom compared to the pressure at the top, certainly it's greater at the bottom. You know that as you go farther up, the air gets thinner, and that's why airplanes have to be pressurized. What's true for a mountain is also true for a man, just to a lesser extent. So here's this man on the bathroom scale, and sure enough, the force at foot level is a little bit greater than the atmospheric force, the pressure, at his head level. Okay, now it's not nearly as pronounced as it is for a mountain because it's a smaller distance. It's only about a meter and a half or two meters. But if you had a sensitive enough pressure gauge, a, pres a, a sensitive enough barometer, let's say one that measured this precisely, 14.715 PSI at floor level, by the time you brought that up to head level, it would be down to about 14.712 PSI, a little bit less pressure. That's to say that there's a little bit more pressure pushing upward on his feet than there is pushing downward on the top of him. So, that creates a buoyant force upward, just as it did for the object on the left. And um, whereas the scale might read, and he thinks with this buoyant force he weighs 100.0 kilograms, that's about 220 pounds, um, actually he weighs a little bit more than that because he's weighing himself in air, and the air is buoying himself up. If we got rid of that buoyant force, and the only way to do that is to get rid of the air, weigh him in a vacuum, which would be kind of painful, I think, for him, but uh, we would at least get what his true weight is, and that would go all the way up to, yeah, a 100.1. A very small effect, because remember, air is very low density. The effect is not nearly as great as it would have been if he had weighed himself, let's say, submerged in water. There he'd be almost weightless, okay? But uh, in air, even still, you weigh a little bit more than you think you do. Okay, at this point, we're going to stop Archimedes Principle Part 1A uh, to keep the video the right time length, less than 10 minutes. Um, but there's an Archimedes Principle Part 1B that picks up where this one left off.